All right, our next lesson is what is this thing called probable cause, right? So probable cause is the standard needed to do various things like arrest people, search their cars, and, um, and, and you know, it's used for exigent circumstances. But probable cause simply requires a fair probability that something's occurring, right? A fair probability usually of a crime being committed. As the Supreme Court said, in dealing with probable cause, however, as the very name implies, we deal with probabilities. These are not technical. They are the factual and practical considerations of everyday life on which reasonable and prudent people, not legal technicians, act. So when the, when the Supreme Court is saying, you know, not just this practical, like everyday life type stuff, not what legal technicians think, who are they referring to when they say legal technicians? Lawyers, right? The point here is that your prosecutor is not the best barometer of, you know, of whether or not probable cause exists because you know things that they don't, right? Sure, they obviously, you know, there's no disrespect to my prosecutors out there, but they're immersed in the law and, you know, uh, you know, rules of evidence and so forth, you're immersed in the criminal world and trying to ferret out crime. So your perception, your training experience is going to be different. And we don't necessarily look at probable cause from the comforts of a nice office with mahogany and leather bound books. We look at it from the eyes of a police officer and their training and experience. Okay. But let me, let me give you a great example of what I mean by this. When I left law enforcement, the big wave of training was for human trafficking. You can now you see it all over the place. You go to the airport, human trafficking this, human trafficking that. Um, you know, you know you see commercials about it. There's public uh, com uh, campaigns, ad campaigns, all kinds of stuff about human trafficking. Well, I never took any human trafficking uh, um, training, so. As a professional instructor, I travel a lot. I have I have been around. It's not you know, you know millions of people collectively over the years that I've been traveling, and I've been in you know almost every major airport in this country, and I've seen all these people. And I got to tell you, I have never once seen human trafficking. Right? I just never seen. I've never seen anything to me that says, yeah, those people are probably that per person might be the victim of human trafficking. I just never seen it. Now I went. I was in Chicago airport one time, and I went to the bathroom, and they had this poster on the, you know, the the wall, and it said, you know, be on the lookout for human trafficking, and it had some text on there, but it also had a bunch of pictures of, I guess, examples of human trafficking, and one of them, one of the pictures was of a person cleaning a hotel room, and I said to myself, oh snap, I have seen that person, right? I mean, I don't know where that gets us. Like, I'm, we're gonna call. 911 every time we see somebody working in a hotel but the point is is I don't know what it looks like. So I was teaching some officers that worked at the airport and I brought this whole thing up, right? And I said, "What do you guys cuz they're the probably the ones that are most trained in human trafficking. That's their that's probably one of their bread and butters, right? Um, what do you guys look for 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 human trafficking?" And they started rattling off all of these little things that to me seem very innocuous, but to them is indicators of human trafficking. And that's the point here. Sometimes your prosecutors are in the same boat. Uh, like I said, you see, you see dead people, you see things that other people do not see, right? So when you see these criminal, when you see a hand to hand transaction, some people look at that and say, Oh, that's just somebody giving a homeless person money. And you're like, no, that's, that's a drug transaction. You're like, really? Why? Because of X, all these factors, right? So the point is, is you need to describe that. Probable cause, however, is not a stringent standard. It does not require suspicion that a crime has been or is being committed, be correct or more likely true than false. Rather, probable cause simply requires a practical, common sense decision whether given all the circumstances, there is a fair probability that contraband or evidence of a crime will be found in a particular place, okay? So it's just common sense. It's not very high. It's just a fair probability. Sometimes it's more likely than not, but sometimes it's it's not quite 
that strict. Um, I have an easy to apply test. This came from a student from one of our classes, and I, I wish I knew the student's name or I'd give him uh, credit. But the student basically said, hey, look, you know, two out of three. This is the two out of three test. This is very informal. This is not like in a case law. But when I heard it, I said, you know what? Actually, that is something I can relate to, right? Do you have a witness? Do you have, did the suspect say anything that implicates them? Did they make any confession? Like, obviously, I did it. That's, ob- that's probable cause. But we also want some, some other evidence, too, because sometimes people might confess to crimes that they didn't commit just to get attention and so forth. Um, admissions are, yeah, I was in the neighborhood, but it wasn't me. You know, that type of stuff, right? Is there any physical evidence? Do they have any um, uh, clothing that was left behind or in, in shoe print that matches their shoe size? Those type of things. So, I like again, two out of three. Um, very informal. This is just kind of best practice. Was there a witness? Any admissions or confessions by the suspect? And finally, any physical evidence? Now, I got a question for you. What minimum level of proof do you need to convict a suspect in court? Well, it's not probable cause. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's barred, right? Beyond a reasonable doubt is the legal burden of proof required to affirm a conviction in a criminal case. In a criminal case, the prosecution bears the burden of proving that the defendant is guilty beyond all reasonable doubt. This means that the prosecution must convince the jury that there is no other reasonable explanation that can come from the evidence presented at trial. In other words, the jury must be virtually certain of the defendant's guilt in order to render a guilty verdict. So it's not beyond all doubt. It's beyond all reasonable doubt. So if the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Who's in charge of finding enough evidence for a beyond a reasonable doubt case? Who's in charge of getting all that evidence together in a package, right, in a a case investigation? Well, if you are a law enforcement officer watching this, you better point the finger at yourself, right? Because you are. It is the job of law enforcement to find enough evidence to convict. And the reason I bring this up is because law enforcement officers have been raised from day one on a diet of probable cause, okay? But probable cause does not get you a conviction. Probable cause simply gets you into the courthouse. Or as my friends, my my, uh, friends from Las Vegas, District Attorney's Office, (laughs) has said, probable cause gets you into the club. Beyond the reasonable doubt gets you into the champagne room. We all want to get into the champagne room, but you got to stop thinking, okay? If you're a law enforcement officer, you got to stop thinking only in probable cause because that is not the legal sign. You are a professional, right? You are an, a, a, a criminal investigator. You got to think about the end game here. The end game is a conviction. So if you are giving your prosecutor a case that is simply full of probable cause, Okay, fine. You are legal. That's a legal arrest. That's a, you know, but that's not a, don't, don't be surprised or shocked or insulted when the prosecutor dismisses that case for, on the merits, because you cannot get a conviction based off of that. It's your job. Now, a lot of prosecutors in big cities have the luxury of investigators that work for them, and they can call that investigator into the office and say, hey, Johnny, do me a favor. There's a, there's a hole in this case. Uh, the officer, you know, put a witness in here, but the witness statement is not that great or it's, go, go get a witness statement. That's great. I mean, I, you know what, if you, if you have those kind of resources, I think that's great. But there are a lot of cops out there that don't, that work for prosecutors that don't have full-time investigators assigned to their office, right? So they'll send it back to you with a nasty gram or something. Now, who's in charge of delivering a beyond a reasonable that case? The prosecutor, right? The prosecutor. So the way I look at it is you're in charge of giving enough lawfully obtained evidence to the prosecutor. Now your job is done, beyond a reasonable doubt. Your, your job is done, right? You're a professional investigator. You got beyond a reasonable doubt. Here you go. Now the prosecutor is in charge on delivering that case basically on your behalf. They know the rules of evidence. 
They know how to select juries. They know how to make arguments. That's how this looks, right? Now, why would you ever make a bare minimum probable cause arrest or citation? Usually you do not want to because oftentimes when you, you know, arrest a person and or you issue a citation, the investigation is over, right? You're done. You're not, sometimes you're, you're continuing, but sometimes you, you, you are permitted um, constitutionally and also, you know, professionally to make an arrest when you, the, the, the case may not be going too far. Well, it may not be, uh, uh, there may not be more of an investigation. Let, let me give you an example. First of all, it handles the problem for the night. There are cops out there that have been to domestic violence calls. And it's just, it's not the best case. There's all kinds of holes in it. The, let's say the husband is the, is the primary aggressor, but the injuries on the, on the wife look self, could potentially be self-injurious. Uh, she is not cooperating. She's highly intoxicated, you know, but look, your, your state requires an arrest, but all, but also you're thinking to yourself, man, if I don't do something tonight, if I don't do something here, I'm going to be back in 15 minutes, right? But you do have probable cause. And at the same time, after you make that arrest, after you write that report, you're thinking, you know what? I will not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to expect a letter from the prosecutor that this case is going to be dismissed because it's just really not ready for trial. I won't let you know that that is okay, right? There's nothing unconstitutional, immoral, unethical, unprofessional about making that kind of arrest. As long as you had probable cause, you know, besides the fact that some states require these arrests, but as long as you have probable cause, it's okay to have a motive other than having a conviction. To, 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 to prevent more harm that you think is going is, is gonna to come and so forth, right? Um, also, don't forget search incident arrest evidence. So sometimes cops will arrest three occupants in a vehicle because there's a, gun, a gun was found. A stolen gun was found you know, in the center console. The driver, the passengers, nobody's admitting to it. I know that the, the driver is always going to be easier to arrest because there's a presumption that they know it's in the car. But the cop also feels that the passengers are also in on it right? And you arrest them, but you know, oftentimes when you arrest these guys, whether it's for drugs, gun, you'll find more evidence on their person to prove their guilt. A holster, an empty holster, nine millimeter cartridge in their pocket or, or a magazine. Uh, the, the passenger saying, all oh, those drugs in the trunk aren't mine. You're like, okay, well look, you know, constructive possession, you guys are all going into jail for it. And you arrest them and you find Tin burnt foil in their pocket, empty, you know, uh, baggie of, of white crystal substance. These type of things help prove that they were in on it originally and finally need to interrogate, right? So you arrest them. Um, you have the probable cause against, you, you have the fair probability that they are involved in the, in the conduct. And then when you take them back to the station or right when you arrest them, oftentimes these guys are like, all right, I'll tell you the truth. I knew about it, but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going to sell it. I wasn't using it. No, that type of stuff. All right. So there's probable cause. All right. See you in the next lesson.